It is important to consider the historical context when it comes to understanding Keats's poetry and the ideals of the Romantic movement in general. So that we can truly understand the poetry of Keats, we must consider the context in which it was written and received. What did the world look like to John Keats? What is the historical backdrop to his remarkable work? Well, in Keats's day, times were certainly turbulent and many changes occurred in the social fabric. It was a time of profound and widespread social and political upheaval. Firstly, we cannot ignore the impact of the French Revolution that was rumbling on in the background. The revolution was a reaction to the severe economic crisis of the time. The storming of the medieval fortress of Bastille on July 14, 1789, began as a hunt for arms, but also for grain to make bread. People were starving. The revolution led to the execution of Louis XVI and then the rise of Napoleon. There were political divisions all over Europe and the revolution is considered by many to mark a strong division between the past and a new type of future. The French Revolution was a primary source of inspiration for the first generation of Romantic poets in particular. We could refer to the Romantic poets as the Big Six and divide them into two sets of three. We have here the first generation, William Blake, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And then the second generation, including Percy Shelley, Lord Byron and of course Keats. The first generation of Romantic poets enthusiastically supported this French revolt against oppression. In London, William Blake wore with pride the revolutionary colours despite attempts by the British government to repress any revolutionary sympathy. Wordsworth's poetry turned from being completely focused on nature and the natural world and he started to show some interest in the human experience. He eagerly travelled to France to participate in the early days of the revolution. He wrote in 1850, but Europe at that time was filled with joy, France standing on the top of golden hours and human nature seeming born again. Coleridge, more of a philosopher than his friend Wordsworth, was actively interested and engaged in the changes that were occurring overseas. Closer to home, things seemed rather shaky too, with England in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a period of history from 1780 to, eight, to 1850. Life up to now had been based on work in agriculture and livestock for most people. But in the 18th century, a change occurred. It became an age of industry and of manufacture. Britain was being devoured by the voracious demands of urbanisation. Towns turned into cities. People who previously worked the land were now working in factories and mills where the conditions were frequently appalling. The population expanded in towns and cities, but housing was often poor and sanitation was appalling. This resulted in widespread disease. Taken from Dickens's journal, 1850. There are foul ditches, open sores and defective drains smelling most offensively. Not a drop of clean water can be obtained. In some of the wells, the water is perfectly black and fetid. The paint on the window frames has become black from the action of the sulphuretted hydrogen gas. Nearly all the inhabitants look unhealthy. The women especially complain of sickness and want of appetite. Their eyes are sunken and their skin shriveled. New technologies 
also threatened the livelihood of some workers. The Luddite disturbances occurred between 1811 and 1817, when weavers and textile workers attacked mills and trashed machines. It echoed strongly of the French Revolution. In Manchester, well, geez. in Manchester, the Peterloo massacre occurred in August 1819. British legislation kept corn prices high and the result was active protests and marches. People demanded electoral reform, lower prices and better wages, and rightly so, their demands were just. This most notorious event, the Peterloo Massacre, meant that 60,000 people gathered in support of parliamentary reform. There was something of a party atmosphere as groups of men, women and children dressed in their Sunday best marched towards Manchester but the procession was accompanied by bands playing music and people dancing alongside. But it turned to carnage, as the crowd was violently dispersed by the military on the orders of the government. People who were already cramped, tired and hot, panicked as the soldiers rode in, and several were crushed as they tried to escape. Soldiers deliberately slashed at both men and women, especially those who had banners. It was later found that their sabres had been sharpened just before the meeting, suggesting that the massacre had been premeditated. Between 10 and 20 people were killed and hundreds more injured. The cavalry were in confusion. They evidently could not, with all the weight of man and horse, penetrate that compact mass of human beings and their sabres were plied to hew a way through naked, held-up hands and defenceless heads, and then chopped limbs and wound-gaping skulls were seen, and groans and cries were mingled with the din of that horrid confusion. Many females appeared as the crowd opened, and striplings or mere youths also were found. Their cries were piteous and heart-rending, and would, one might have supposed, have disarmed any human resentment. But here their appeals were in vain. In 10 minutes from the commencement of the havoc, the field was an open and almost deserted space. The sun looked down through a sultry and motionless air. The curtains and blinds of the windows within view were all closed. The hustings remained, with a few broken and hewed flagstaves erect, and a torn and gashed banner or two dropping whilst over the whole field were strewed caps, bonnets, hats, shawls and shoes, and other parts of male and female dress, trampled, torn and bloody. Several mounds of human beings still remained where they had fallen, crushed down and smothered. Some of these still groaning, others with staring eyes were gasping for breath, and others would never breathe more. All was silent save those low sounds, and the occasional snorting and pawing of steeds. The second generation of Romantic poets reacted against this oppression by the brutal Tory government. In his poem, The Mask of Anarchy, Shelley lays bare the hypocrisy of the government and calls for the people to continue to challenge its rule despite the violence deployed against them. It culminates with the famous verse. Rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. So there we have it. The first two generations of romantic poets lived through a time of extraordinary upheaval. The life-altering French Revolution abroad, and here at home the continuing Industrial Revolution. These events led to many changes in both culture and politics. We see poets of the time directly commenting on these changes. Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley and Byron show reaction to these events in their work. So what about Keats? Well, Keats and politics don't naturally seem to go hand in hand. Here is a poet 
famous for nightingales, urns and dying tragically young. We picture him on his sickbed in Rome, a fragile creature cruelly torn from life too soon. We don't tend to think of Keats as a radical, waving banners and writing angry letters to Parliament. But is this true? Is it fair? Well, not really. It is true that we don't see a lot of political commentary in Keats's work, aside from some of his early work, which was basically written to impress his new friend Lee Hunt and his radical, cool social circle. But we do see some political stance in Keats's letters. He demonstrated that he abhorred tyranny and had great sympathy with those who were suffering. He was committed to a liberal view of history as progressive enlightenment, a continual chance for the better. <laughs> 